lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixon. I'm Michael, and I'm here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? Doing okay. How are you? Oh, pretty good. Pretty good? Yeah. yeah. I got me a little drink here. Sipping yeah. Sipping on. So, I'm, I'm doing all right. Yeah. That was the one that you gave to me, right? Oh, it is. That is the one I gave you, the yeah. sensei. Yeah. It's good. I like it. Yeah. I like it too. Them Japanese folk know how to make some whiskey. Yeah. Who would have thought? <laughs> so, I, so I've had several, and um, my favorite still, hands down, is the Hibiki 12. Well, that's the one that turned me on to the Japanese whiskey. Oh, man. Like, I, I had it over here when you had gotten that bottle, and I was like, oh, wow, this is yeah. good. Like, that's legit. <laughs> yeah. I got it a couple of times. Then they made some kind of change. So... Hibiki 12 used to be their low end, their low end, uh, yeah. you know, which was still like a 50 ish dollar bottle. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and of course all this is handled through the state here. So now they don't have Hibiki anything <laughs> <laughs> yeah. available, but, um, the Hibiki 12 used to be their low end. And then, um, they added a, so they bumped that one up. Same product, but then it became it went from fifty dollars to eighty dollars, and they Ooh. added in a new product underneath it yeah. uh, called Hibiki Harmony or something like that. Yeah, um, which was a an un well, I mean it, it's it's aged, but they didn't tell you how aged it was blend. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, uh, and it was good, but it wasn't as good. Yeah. Went, and, went on the same level. Yeah, and it was weird to suddenly be paying 60% more for the exact same product. Yeah. <laughs> and then they took it off the shelves in Alabama anyway. So it became not too bad irrelevant. Yep. Yeah. I would still buy it though. Yeah. yeah. Especially now that I haven't had it in a while. Now I'm missing right, it. Now you're kind of craving it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. I just finished off the Rittenhouse. Ah, I always, I say it all the time. I'm sure I said it on the podcast, but the Rittenhouse for the, for the dollar amount, for mm -hmm. the quality, you can't find it better, man. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's one of the best. It's it's one of my favorite whiskeys. Yeah. No, it, it is. And it's at $25 a bottle. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you really can't. Quality for price, like, you, it can't be matched. <laughs> no. Agree. Um, I don't know. You want to get right into it? or? Yeah, let's do it, man. All right. What we want to talk about. Well, you told me, so. <laughs> oh, yeah. We were going to talk about the Chauvin case. Yeah. I have not followed news this week yeah. been occupied with other things. Yeah. Um, bringing my mom home and such. So, yeah, it's been uh, a, it's been yeah I just haven't, I just haven't kept up with stuff, yeah. but that doesn't mean that I don't have opinions, but you can, you can like <laughs> fill in the background. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I'm sure everybody knows the Chauvin case went on this, or it's been going on, I guess a couple of weeks. The, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, they came down with a guilty on all counts, um, I guess what day was it? It was t was it Tuesday? The verdict came out. Must have been Tuesday. Um, so yeah, guilty on all counts, which surprised me. Um, I didn't watch a lot of the trial. I watched um, the uh, hour or so of the closing arguments from the defense, um, and I thought they made a fairly compelling case, depending on kind of where your views are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I mean, if you're a big supporter of law enforcement. I think they made a pretty good case. Yeah. Um, now, if you're like me, who doesn't really, not really a big fan of law enforcement and thinks that there needs to be some real changes, mm -hmm. there's some holes in that. <laughs> yeah. But I thought they made a pretty compelling case. And I saw some other parts of the trial just here and there. But my real feeling was, was they were going to come down on maybe the lowest count. Manslaughter, manslaughter probably. Yeah. Or uh, negligent homicide or something like that. I don't know. Yeah. They had a couple of different ones and I don't remember specifically, but I figured they'd come down on the, on the weakest one, um, to kind of say that they did something, but kind of walked that line. I was surprised they came down on with all three. Yeah. Well, it definitely proved me wrong. That's what I said in the last podcast is I expected it would be the, the, uh, Lesser. manslaughter yeah. uh, or negligent homicide, whatever they had at the lowest level. Yeah. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm definitely surprised with the result. Uh, I don't know that that's as good as everybody thinks. Um, I and well, so the other thing is, I still think uh, by the letter of the law, it wasn't the right verdict. Uh, yeah. Not to say that I I'm not pleased to see this guy go to jail for this because I absolutely am. Because I do think he was wrong with what he did. Absolutely. Like yeah. I mean, I think uh, leaving everything else aside, just looking morally, I think that he mm -hmm. was absolutely 
wrong for what he done. Yeah. But as uh, just like you're saying, when you look at what the and that's why I say there was if you believe in like law enforcement, like like I, I say believe in law enforcement, but really a big supporter of law enforcement. I think the defense made a very compelling case mm -hmm. because basically they came out and was like, look, whether this what regardless of what you think, he did what his training told him to do yeah um and they went through line by line through the video that's the reason like i said i didn't even watch it all but it was mm -hmm. i probably watched an hour of it and they probably went on two hours the defense or, or in the closing arguments mm -hmm. and um because they went through line by line video by like any video that was available they showed it all from different angles and the whole thing and um like i say i mean like they went through like this is what this guy was trained to do yeah, you know, like it or not, like mm -hmm. <laughs> that's what with with what with everything that he knew at the time. Like I say, I mean, you can go back in hindsight and be like, yeah, well, maybe this wasn't the right call or that one, but you you can't really judge him on that. You have to judge him on what he knew and what you know that he knew. Yeah. Um, well, I think that this is um, this is not the beginning of a change. Um, that this doesn't represent some kind of shift in how this stuff's going to be handled. It's, it's nice to see some accountability. Um, and yeah, I use that word. Uh, it's, well, it's nice to see some accountability, but I don't think that this is going to, um, it, I don't think that this is going to, uh, create the sea change that a lot of people think. And, and the, the, because, I think that in a lot of ways, as far as the movement is, is concerned, in in terms of changing um, the way law enforcement is done in this country, the way policing is done in this country, yeah. this is a bad result because yeah. um, it makes it as if this guy was a bad cop and an aberration. Yeah, and um, I think that the problem is the well, the way the law is and the way police are and it doesn't address policing the, is done it doesn't address the training just like what mm -hmm. like we're you know i mean it just it doesn't address any of that it just uh, kind of puts all of that to the side and yeah. shows that well even if the training says one thing they can still be held guilty <laughs> for yeah. if somebody accidentally dies yeah you know? i mean uh, all you've proven here is that um if you can stir up enough uh you know, um, racial tension and there's a 10 minute video of this guy brutally. Well, I mean, it's not even that brutal really. I mean, it's, it's terrible yeah, It is yeah. uh, to watch. And, um, it, it certainly, uh, creates sympathy for the guy, yeah. um, for George Floyd, yeah. um, the way it's done. Um, so, but I, I think that in terms of, you know, this creating, um, a sense of accountability for police officers uh, when they um, apply too much force uh, or excess force, however you know, however you want to term it. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think that this is going to make any change at all. I think as long as there's not a 10 minute video that <laughs> elicits sympathy for the victim, yeah. um, that policing will just kind of go about it as usual. I think yeah. as much as anything, it's probably going to create more conflict or more confrontation as people try and video police in action. Yeah. Um, and while there's nothing illegal about that, they certainly treat it like it is. Yeah. They don't, they don't uh, ever see it that way. <laughs> yeah. Um, and of course uh, we, we've talked on, or, this might have been something that I addressed when I was doing one of the podcasts on my own, but there's uh, there was a security bill in France that made it illegal um, for uh, people to post videos on social media of cops. Yeah, um, I remember where that. you could identify them. Yeah, I do remember. And us. Um, they were saying, well, it creates a dangerous situation for cops, like not if they're acting right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> and the, the larger thing too that to kind of, that would fix a lot of this problem is. And, and we talked about it when all of this started with the George Floyd stuff is we the, the real way to, to fix a lot of these problems with, with law enforcement is to have them enforcing less laws. Yeah. The problem is with the state. Yeah. Yeah. The problem is with the government. Like it's not necessarily even with the police. And I don't understand why more police police departments and stuff don't get behind this. Mm -hmm. Like they're all like, oh, we can't decriminalize drugs or anything because like it'll be dangerous. But it'll be I'm, you're like, it'll be more safer for the police, though. It's not just <laughs> going to be more safer for us citizens. Yeah. It'll be more safer for you, too. Mm -hmm. You won't have to, to do all of this revenue grabbing that you're doing now, which is basically mm -hmm. all they're doing. Yeah, I um, 
I think that the another problem with this is that the uh, racial bit has been the focus. Yeah. Um, so not only is this an aberration and a bad cop, but he's a bad racist cop. Yeah. And an aberration. Well, and the problem here is not racism. The problem no. is state. Oh, the absolutely. problem is policing, not yep. not racism. Not to say that racism doesn't exist in this country, oh. but that's not the problem that that. Yeah. that we saw here no. is not racism. Well, and that's the only... You, if, if George Floyd had been white, you never would have heard of this case. Yeah. Like, I mean, that's just what it is, you know? Um, and that's that's a problem. Like, mm-hmm. anytime somebody dies at the hand of law enforcement, it should be a big deal regardless of who they are. Yeah. Um, well, and if the cop that had been sitting on his neck had been black, it wouldn't have been. It wouldn't have been. A, absolutely. Either. Um, so there are a lot more white people, unarmed white men killed by cops than there are unarmed black men killed by cops. Now, granted, um, the the by percentage of the population, uh, black people are more affected. Yeah. But what you have to start asking yourself somewhere along the way is, is a law that affects one race more than another a racist law yeah. or is it just, you know, uh, it's just a problem with the result, but yeah. the law is still the problem yeah. regardless. It, it affects <laughs> either way. Yeah. It affects everybody. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, just because it's affecting one group more than another, that's not the problem with the law. The problem is the law, the, the base law to begin with. Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, I, I think that people were looking for a sea change and they're not going to get it with this. And yeah. I think that what we really want is an, is an exchange. Yeah. All right. Like not a sea change, an exchange yeah. um, that we want to change the way law enforcement is done in this country. And yeah. of course, if we had our druthers, it would be privatized. Well, yeah. Um, and you know, the defund the police, it's, it's not a bad idea, but it's not the answer either. Yeah. Um, you have to have, you do have to have something to replace it. Well, and, and there's plenty of private security out there, but at least at the beginning, what you would end up with in private security is all the guys that just got fired from the police department. <laughs> all right. Um, now it's still going to make a difference Yeah. because, well, because of the they won't be protected by the same people that are, you know, essentially they work for the same people that decide whether they did anything bad or not. Yeah. Um, if the court system is separate from the law enforcement system, then there will be, there will more, be more accountability. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And the market will provide accountability. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Know? Because you don't want to like, yeah. you don't, if you're a business owner doing private security for, a um, a residential area or whatever it happens to be. And there's tons of them out there. Yeah. Um, you don't want your contract to be influenced in any way by your people going out there and beating the hell out of somebody that lives in the neighborhood <laughs> yeah. or one of their friends that or something like over that. Over visiting or something like that. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, whereas the, the police departments, they don't much have to worry about that. No, no, and this concerned. doesn't change that. No, not at all. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that, uh, I think that, I think the results in terms of if you want to see a change in how policing is done in this country, how law enforcement is handled, um, then this is not a good result. Uh, I think that it would have been better if they had stuck with the letter of the law and um, convicted him of some, uh, I mean, relatively minor offense of the uh, of what was available to them, uh, because I think that that legally speaking, that's probably the right verdict. And I think that that would create more of an opportunity for there to be public pressure to just change how the whole system is done. Because the conversation in the media right now would have been why he got off. Mm -hmm. Um, And because if, if that's, if yeah, they would be about why he got off, and then that would well, create pressure. Well, the answer would be though in the media right now. The answer would be well because, because he's, he's a white, white guy. guy. Yeah, yeah, but I still think they'd have to have the conversation over the you know over the legal intricacies of well this. Yeah, strictly speaking, he, what he did was not illegal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I um, think they would at least like it. May not just like you say, it probably wouldn't be on the forefront because on the mm-hmm. forefront would be like white cop, black guy. Yeah. Um, so of course. Yeah, yeah. 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 You put it together, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but but they would at least it would at least be kind of out there more mm-hmm. than what it is now. Yeah. So. Um. And it just mm-hmm. irritates me. Um. Like, it's just me personally. So, like, I've been on the road a lot here late at night, and I don't know 
anybody in Baldwin County can tell you, if you're on the road much past one o'clock, all you see is police. Like they're everywhere. I mean, that's the only cars you're going to encounter. And it just really bothers me that like, so I'm driving along at night and especially on some of these back roads in the County, um, and see police and like, like I don't feel safer when I pass a cop Yeah, and I'm not drunk. I'm not like, I don't have anything in the car to be concerned about. I'm perfectly legal just driving around, mm-hmm. but I know if I get stopped, it's not going to be a good time. Yeah. And, and that bothers me. Like it, sh- it shouldn't be that way. That's mm-hmm. not how law enforcement should be. I shouldn't fear cops when I know for a fact I'm not doing anything wrong. Yeah. I think that, that if everybody s- stepped back and really looked at it, objectively they would see that we would be better off with private policing yeah. with uh, or with community policing yeah. um neighborhood watches and things, things like that stuff like that yeah um because I don't know that there's anybody that feels better when they see a cop on the road anymore. No. I, I know that I don't. I, I grew don't. up in a law enforcement family and I still don't feel more comfortable when I see a, a policeman yeah. um in a car anywhere near me. Yeah. And they're completely disconnected from their, com- well, not completely. That's not, that's not fair. Um, but they're certainly more disconnected from their communities than they were historically. Yeah. Uh, and I think that that's done intentionally. Yeah. And another thing that I would like to know, and you could probably piece together these kind of, de- the, these kind of um, details or statistics, uh, but I would like to know how much of their budget is actually spent on activities that generate revenue for the municipality or county or, you know, whoever they're working for the government itself. Yeah. Uh, because I feel like there's not so much policing in terms of trying to find or, or to make things right for, uh, victims of crimes as there is, um, trying to find you, um, uh, doing something that they can cite you for so that you can pay into the system. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's, and I tell you once, especially, especially for people who's had a history of like drug problems or something, Mm -hmm. once you're in that system, it's extremely difficult to get out. Like just, just through everything that's required of you and financially, Mm -hmm. like even if you've gotten clean, it's still hard for you to get financially get out of the legal system. Yeah. Um, At least here in Baldwin County, like I know people personally who's dealt with exactly that problem. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, gotten in trouble for drugs along the way they've gotten clean and they're still paying off debt from being in the legal system. And the way the way it's set up is like, if you don't pay that debt, you're right back in jail again, which is, it's just a vicious cycle. Yeah. Um, I mean, one of the things that I have recommended to our county party yeah. in terms of something to do to get more involved in the community um, is to create uh, some kind of um, of uh, program to find work for ex-cons. Yeah. Uh, because I, I think that it's important if you're, if you're talking about a system, well, it, it's also a, it says something about the system that's, that's supposed to be a rehabilitative system, not a punitive system. They tell us yeah, yeah. Um, that people don't want to hire people that have come out of that system. Yeah. But the idea is supposed to be that you've, you've, you did the crime, yeah. you've done the time, you yeah. paid your debt. Yeah. It's time to reenter society, but it's yeah. very difficult for oh. an ex con to reenter society. Absolutely. They only get the most basic of jobs. They're disqualified from almost everything. Like, and so in the end, what, you're t- what you almost do is force them back into criminal life to support themselves. Exactly. And it's something they know how to do. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's, well, I mean, they got experience. Not perfectly <laughs> because they ended up in jail for it, but, yeah. you know. Um, and I, I think that, that as a society, both in terms of um, creating a less punitive, more rehabilitative system— uh, is important, but also to help those people who have been through the system transition back into a normal life. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and that's something, yeah, I, I, it's something that I think that we could do as a County party. Um, although I don't know exactly how to do it. I'm open to suggestions. So again, yeah. Michael at the Liberty of Mike. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I would like to see more programs like that to, to find, you know, and it, it, it at least for nonviolent criminals. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, um, and I'm not saying, you know, put them in people's homes and, and things like that, but yeah. there are plenty of, uh, of 
um, skilled and unskilled labor jobs that could be taken by these well, people. Well, and the, uh, that's another whole another topic. But the labor market in this county, at least, is crazy right now. Like people can't find help, like doing anything. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it's oh just, well, that's because people can get paid more for sitting at home than doing a, a low skill job. It's probably true. Um, but at any rate, like any restaurant you go into right now, any business really you go into right now, like these, they're, none of them are running the way they ought to be right? like peak performance. Yeah. And it's all because of, of help. It's all because of, they don't have the employees to do so. Yeah. Well, again, I mean, the yeah. reason is because the well, it's because of the, the government, government has yeah. so completely screwed up the labor market by offering more money. There was a time last year, like I have a good professional job, yeah. and there was a time last year when I could have made more money unemployed yeah. than working at my good professional job. <laughs> exactly, and that's a that's a problem. That's it's yeah. And, and so I, certainly for unskilled labor, there's just no contest. Yeah. I mean, why would you go to work for $700 a week when you can make $1,500 a week on and unemployment? Not, and not work. <laughs> yeah. Or and, do something under the table. Or. Um, I was talking to a business owner just recently, and he, you know the system's very similar. Like I was on in that system in uh, Georgia at one point before I moved back here, mm. uh, where I was unemployed for a few months. And um, so they have a you know, like a quota kind of thing where you have to make so many contacts a week to, to continue to get your unemployment so that you're trying to find a job. Um, so, uh, this business owner was telling me that, uh, he, um, has had consistently between eight and 10 interviews a day, um, people coming into his business. And he said only about 20% of them show up. Yeah. And he said, you know, because we've got a good system that confirms appointments and so forth. So you get an email and a text yeah. confirming your appointment at such and such a time. Well, now those people have documentation to take back to the unemployment office that they yeah. that they made a contact. So yep. they don't even show up for the interview. Yeah, because they don't want to get the job. Yeah, like, that's the last thing they want. <laughs> yeah, and that was a trick that people played certainly in Georgia, and I imagine goes on here is that you apply for a job that there's no way you'll get. Yeah. I mean, that was back when unemployment wasn't as much, but yeah. um, that you would apply for jobs that you were totally unqualified for or i yeah. i didn't i mean i was like trying to find a job yeah, i didn't want to be in the job. system but <laughs> yeah. um but you know i met people along the way yeah. that just applied for jobs that there was no way they could ever be qualified or there was no way they were qualified for yeah. and so they would apply for these jobs and they would get rejected but it counted as their contacts yeah and it showed that they were working to find a job <laughs> yep. um so they can keep getting those benefits to sit at home and do next to nothing and yeah. by the way Three contacts a week, which is what was required in Georgia at the time, that is nothing. That takes about <laughs> up about 15 minutes of your week. Yeah. Now, if you don't have a job, yeah. probably your job should be finding a job. <laughs> right? I so mean, you should you probably should spend... spend roughly 40 hours a week trying to find a job. You can right? make a whole lot more than three contacts in that amount of time. Oh, absolutely. Um, absolutely. But that's not how... It's you not ins- how it's set up. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a perverse incentive. Yeah, yeah. And um, and these are just really common in, are common in government in government programs. Yeah. And the other side of this, uh, so I, I was talking to my my mom about the uh, Chauvin stuff, and um, and we have said here that it's not a racial issue; it's a it's a policing issue; it's a state issue; it's a yeah. problem with government; it's not a problem with racism. Yeah. Um, and uh, we were talking about how the media has really, pre- well, media and government officials have really pressed the the race uh, question in this, the racial tensions, and, and ratcheted them up as much as they could. Yeah. And uh, she was asking me, like, why would you, why would you foment division like this? Yeah. Um, and I said, well, <laughs> you know, there's a bunch of reasons for it. Certainly for the press, uh, for... For the press, there's two things. One, they're a mouthpiece for the government anyway. Yeah. Um, and second, uh, or at least mainstream media. Mm. Um, and second, like it drives views. Yeah. Like well, it, that's and that's the big thing. It, it drives ratings. It drives views. And mm-hmm. as much as people say they don't want to hear that stuff. They tune in. Yeah, people watch Jerry Springer for yeah, a reason. Exactly. You know, like it was the best rated daytime TV show for a while, wasn't it? Oh, it was. Yeah, yeah. there was a time. And that, by the way, this show st- I didn't realize that show's still on. Like is it, I watched that. Is and- it like syndicated? Is it reruns or is it like new stuff? <sighs> I, I, I gather that's still new ones, but mm-hmm. I don't. I, I didn't watch it, so I don't actually know. But I mean, I remember when that show was on in high school. Yeah. Like I think the reason the ratings were so high is because everybody in high school was watching it when they were mm-hmm. between like in class. 
class with no teacher or something. <laughs> with uh, with a candy uh, former prostitute. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I was yeah. so I was trying to I couldn't remember the name of the book, but there's a um, Chuck Palahniuk book. Um, who's the guy that wrote Fight Club. That's what he's ah. best known for. Yeah. Uh, but uh, there, one of his books, the the narrator um, watches a whole bunch of of late night TV, which is reruns of daytime television like yeah, that. Yeah. And so she starts talking to about people the way they're listed on these kind of programs. Yeah. And so it's, you know, first name and then some description of them that she uses as a last name. <laughs> yeah. So it's, you know, Candy former prostitute. And that's, <laughs> that's her, her name. name. And, Candy former prostitute. And so, yeah. but it comes up over and over again in the book. There was a while after I read this book that I started doing this with people, you <laughs> yeah. know, that I saw like making up little taglines tag for, lines for, them. <laughs> for yeah. Me, yeah. Um, But that's how she refers to people throughout the book is, uh, you know, with these little kinds of things like that. That's uh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> and I think about that every time I think about Jerry Springer or anything like that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it drives ratings, and uh, for the for people in power, um, it's a divide and conquer strategy. Yeah, and it it may or may not be like actually formed in their head that way, but that that's what it is either way. Well, I think it is. I mean, I think I, that it's I absolutely think it's a conscious decision. Yeah, um, and I think it has. And Dave Smith's talked a lot about this on his podcast recently, um, off and on. But I think he makes a good point that you know all of this really started shortly after the um the uh, the one percent protest the occupy wall street like I, I think i think there was a realization amongst a lot of group powerful groups that mm -hmm. this could be bad like it yeah. may be we may have squashed it this time but we can't let this keep happening and happen again yeah um and and i think that the media kind of took that and was like all right well we'll just start dividing people up because once you divide them up it's a lot easier mm -hmm. because like occupy wall street was a pretty like not divided up. I mean, that was pretty well everybody. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, they're, I, and they may not have had the most intelligent arguments, those, some of those people, but they were all kind of unified under one idea, you know? Yeah. Oh, gosh, there's the, um, the, uh, funds trader guy that, um, I used to listen to a lot. And I can't think of his name now that went down there with the sign that says, with, I am the 1%, you yeah. know, come ask me questions yeah. and defended the position. Well, I mean, yeah. he's a, like a, he's a good libertarian actually yeah. for the most part, which is why he was able to divert to, everything towards, you know, the governmental systems, the, yeah. the state, that the government being, is the problem. Here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, gosh, why can't I think of his name? I don't, oh, well. I don't know who you're talking about. So. Uh, uh, I kind of wish I did, though. Maybe you'll have to remember later. Yeah, I, so I listened to his podcast for a while. Um, he, I ran into just like a point where I needed, there were other podcasts that were more important to me yeah. um, to listen to. Uh, uh, Schiff is his last oh, name. Oh, um, ah, I know who you're talking about. Um, ah, dang it. It's not. I, I know his, his dad is Irwin, and he yeah. ended up dying in prison for not paying his taxes. Oh, I know exactly. Um, who I didn't realize he went down there. I know who you're talking about. Pete Shift. Uh, Peter Shift. Yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, that was the guy. Okay. Um, I didn't know he went down there. I may have to look some of that up. That might be fun. Yeah. Uh, I the like YouTube that videos out there, like, it, yeah. I mean, he had the whole thing recorded while he was answering all these people's questions. And there were people that came in, like, really angry with him, and he just very calmly explained. Uh, you know, the problems with the system yeah. that created that. It was really interesting, actually. Like, he did a good job of, of defending really. his position. Now, there were plenty of people out there that didn't care what he had to say yeah. either. They well, just kept and pressing. And there were but, plenty of people out there that just didn't understand what was going on and, and yeah. in general, you know. But you're mm -hmm. going to find that anytime you have a large group of people. Yeah. Like, um, But the point is that, you know, why do you foment division? It's because uh, if we're all down here thinking that it's, Black versus white, man versus woman, um, rich versus poor, uh, professional versus working class, you know, whatever all these divisions are, like, yeah. then we spend all this time fighting amongst each other and never looking up at where the real problem is. Exactly. And, the, you know, the real problem is the political elite, yeah. the people that are actually running this, yeah. the, well, the rulers. Yeah, the people that are running the government. The government's yeah. the problem and the people who are running it are a big problem part of that problem <laughs> yeah yeah they're they're feeding into it and and they're doing what 
they can to I mean I mean it's pretty to, to natural. exploit the system. Yeah. yeah. And to maintain their own power. And maintain which is, power. Yeah. Which is the only reason most of these people run for those offices anyway. I don't know that that's true. I think that that becomes the truth. Yeah. Um but I think that when I think that there's a lot of people that enter the system thinking that they're going to make a difference and that they're going to do something positive, but it doesn't take them long. I mean, take yeah. uh, AOC as an example. Yeah. Um, you know, Sandy got in there seeming like she was going to be, now she had, she had backing from, you know, big groups and, and so forth. But um, it certainly seemed like she probably got into it because she thought she was going to make a difference. Yeah. And really affect people's lives. But she, she has fallen in line. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> and she's getting some criticism for it now too, which is also nice to see. But, yeah. um, I mean, I don't have a whole lot of sympathy for her because anybody who is still a socialist just doesn't know anything about history. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, um, this you time is going to be different. I, I do think that she got involved in government because she wanted to help people help and people. wanted to improve people's lives. Well, and, but definitely... now she's been there and she's gotten this big, I mean, she went from being, um, a, uh, a bartender or whatever to being a congressperson. She went yeah. from probably making but forty to sixty thousand dollars a year to like a hundred and sixty thousand dollars a year. Yeah. And she probably doesn't want to lose that. So she's yeah. gonna do what she has to do to keep that job. Oh absolutely. And keeping that job right now for her means falling in line with Nancy Pelosi. Yeah. Well, and that's true, but that's definitely not like the normal story for how people end up. Like most of these guys no, but are I, attorneys and whatnot. Yeah, but. Um, but I still think that probably most of them entered politics originally because they wanted to to make yeah. positive changes. Yeah. Um, I still kind of and err on I the think side. that the the people that survive it are the are the sociopaths. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> that's probably true too. <laughs> Um, and you know, it, I, I just don't think it takes long of being in the system to really become a part of the system instead of trying to change the system. Well, and, and to have, have that power. The status quo benefits you. Yeah. Well, to have that power as a congressman or something like that, I mean, because they address you a certain way, like once mm. you're, you're in Congress and whatnot, and people like take to that. Like it doesn't take yeah. long to be treated that way to think that you're just above everybody. Yeah. It, it that actually, that stuff kind of irritates me, the titles and all yeah. that. Oh, um, yeah. Um, this is... You know, this is a, a new form of aristocracy, which is really this country was founded with the intention of kind of eliminating Not having that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but this is that's what we've got. So it's, you know, it's Congressman Byrne. Yeah. I, I call him. Mm -hmm. I call him Bradley Byrne or Mr. Byrne. Oh, I, like, yeah, I, I, I like Mr. Byrne, but <laughs> yeah, he reminds me of Mr. Like, Byrne. I prefer not to use that title. And if yeah. it offends him, oh, well, I don't really care. Of course, yeah. I mean, I don't think that what I'm calling him has offended him nearly as much as <laughs> the questions that I've to asked say, him. yeah. But, um, <laughs> right. you know, it. it's, I, I think that the, the main, uh, so, and I do have uh, some respect for decorum. I mean, I, oh, I yeah. think that there, there is a, um, a reason for formality um, to it because it, it kind of keeps things under control. And I, I don't want, if you even, though, to, even though you're an anarchist, you don't want chaos. Yeah. Well, no, no, that's not what anarchy is about. <laughs> oh, it's exactly. not about chaos. It's about not having a rulers. Exactly. Um, leaders are fine. Rulers are a problem. Yeah. Um, but the other thing is like, I don't want fist fights on the floor of Congress either. Well, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I mean, as entertaining as it is to listen to the, the British parliament insult each other and so forth. Like, I'm kind of yeah. glad that that doesn't happen here. Well, yeah. Um, because that's not what's important. Like it, throwing a bunch of insults back and forth doesn't solve problems. Yeah. Like, Although most of the time I'd rather have them doing that than whatever they're actually doing. Well, yeah. I mean, that's better than them actually <laughs> passing bills. And, yeah. I mean, that's because the, the bills always, seem to be worse like yeah. it's just more government on top of more government right um but i i do think that the there's you know there's a place for decorum and i think that formality is important because while i don't believe in rulers i do believe in rules i like rules i think yeah. rules are important yeah um and because it you know it eliminates the chaos in a lot of ways yeah but uh the the titles and so forth bothers me. The, the, these people are due respect just because of the position they hold. Yeah. I disagree with that. Oh, absolutely. And frankly, the same thing for police officers. Yeah. Yeah. And soldiers. That's a real unpopular opinion. Yeah. Um, just because you, you served in the, uh, in the armed forces doesn't yeah. mean you automatically deserve respect. Yeah. Well, I, I don't necessarily disagree with that. Yeah. Um, 
But at the same time, and it's respect for me is something that's all, and I've always felt this way. It's something that's earned. It's, it's mm-hmm. yeah, you don't get it through a title or through this and that, like or an occupation or an occupation. It's something mm-hmm. that's earned. Yeah, um, and it's earned through a various different ways. But it's something. It is something you have to to earn. Mm-hmm. So. Now, I do think that the, the the default position should be to be respectful. Well, and I think if everybody followed that, like we, yeah. <laughs> we'd be in a completely different place. The, um, but at the same time, I think you should have the right to be an ass. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I, but the, but um, you shouldn't be like. <laughs> there's the guy you might know his name. Um, I can't think of it, but. Because I'm terrible with names, yeah. Which we're proving repeatedly on this particular <laughs> episode. But uh, there's the guy um, who was a uh, was on Star Trek, and now he does a whole bunch of gaming stuff. Oh, um, I do know who. Will you're something Wheaton? Will Wheaton? Yeah, yeah. there you go. Okay, he was on so, Big Bang Theory a yeah, bunch. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Will Wheaton's rules rule for gaming is don't be a dick. Yeah. <laughs> and that's like to me, that's just like a rule for life. That's a like, good, that's a good rule. <laughs> the world to live by. Speaking, yeah. Along with uh, when you go to work hungover, you just find a ladder and take a nap at the bottom of it. <laughs> yeah. <all right. laughs> that way, if you're caught, you can say you fell off the ladder and lost consciousness. <laughs> yeah. There you go. <laughs> uh, kind um, of works both ways. Here, <laughs> yeah. Right? And then you get workers cop too. Uh, <laughs> there you go. So um, anyway, uh, I. I I don't know how to transition this into something else exactly. I'm, I'm, I'm lost. Um, so I'm just going to just like really abruptly transition because I don't sure. think, do you have anything more no, to say no, on no, that? I'm yeah. good on all that. Um, I thought this is actually like a little topic. We've got, you know, 10 or 15 minutes left. Um, that especially considering my background, we've spent very little time talking about. Um, and that's uh, public education. Oh, Okay. All right. So, um, I, I was talking to my brother. Some my brother was in town for the last week, and uh, and I actually feel like I have to be very careful about political topics around him now, which I never felt like that <laughs> before. Yeah. But now it it feels like this is um, this can be dangerous ground. Yeah. I guess. Uh, well, we hold some pretty extreme opinions. Well, and he mostly agrees with us. Actually, he he's become very, very critical of conservative thought. Now he said he was just conservative the uh, or uh, critical of the media. Yeah. Um, well, more power to you there. <laughs> yeah. And I absolutely agree with that point. And he, you know, he said something about, um, uh, something about, you know, may, um, he's definitely not a Republican, but he may have to turn to uh, be a Democrat. And I was like, why don't you be a libertarian? Yeah. Right. And he said, well, at least they have the right idea. And I, well, okay, isn't yeah. that what's important? Yeah, exactly. At the end of the That's day, the like, point, right? <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, talking with him, and he, you know, he hates taxes. Yeah. Like, this is something that we absolutely agree about. <laughs> he hates taxes, yeah. and uh, but he said something about you know, um, public education at least it was important. Yeah, and I was like, why well, don't I just don't? It's not like. It's not like people didn't get educated if they wanted to in history yeah. before. It, it's not like before the state started providing free education and it's not free, but before the state pr- provided for the compulsory education yeah. um, that they said, you have to get educated. And so we're going to offer you this one. Yeah. Um, it's not like people didn't get educated if they wanted to. Uh, there, The time before public education, there were a lot of people who didn't need an education to do the things that they needed to do to make a living. Yeah. Now an education is more or less required. At least some some level some of education. Some sort of education, yeah. Is required. And actually, I would say that even before, like you got an education, but it was in different things. Like if you were going to grow up to be a farmer, you got an education. Yeah. It was just about farming. It was just how to farm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, and then it, it's... It's not like only the rich were educated because churches provided education, um, communities provided education. These are things that were handled by people before the government was handling them. Yeah, and it goes back to something that's a real common theme, too, that once the government starts providing a service, 
it it becomes like you wouldn't have that service if the government didn't provide it. Mm-hmm. And education is just one example, but there's plenty of, you know, the government hasn't always done these things and these yeah. things would exist without the government. I mean, roads is a good example. Yeah. Like, I mean, it's pe- not like there were no roads before government. Yeah. I mean, the, the government didn't invent roads. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> like they existed before government. Or schools. Or uh, schools fall into the same category. Yeah. So that's just something important for people to remember. Just because government mm-hmm. doesn't provide it doesn't mean it won't exist. Yeah. So. If it's seen as needed, people will provide it. Exactly. And if you think that everything's going to cost money, it doesn't. Yeah. Right? Churches, I mean, it it did cost money, but people tithe and people people donate to the church. People willingly gave their money for these things. Well, And they and will do it right more. now. Um, we spend an obscene amount on uh, public education per student. And, and it's hard. I don't remember all of these numbers now, but when I was running for office, yeah, I brought them up all the time. Yeah. That, um, the, that on average, the county was spending more per student on public education than it cost to go to private schools. Yeah, yeah. And they're not getting the education that they would get in the private school. Yeah, and they were getting better educations in private schools. So the education was better and it cost cost less. The thing is that, and we'll just take me as an example, I don't have any kids in school. I'm still paying for it. Yeah. Well, and something people have to remember. I'm paying to educate your kids, kids badly. <laughs> right? <laughs> well, the thing people thing people has to remember, too, is if you take taxes out of the equation, people will be more willing to give to organizations and whatnot. Because when when you're paying your taxes, you're like, well, that's what my taxes are going to. Yeah, it becomes a cop-out. It becomes a cop yeah. yeah. Well, but it becomes a cop-out frame of mind too. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, people really believe that. Like, you know, well, I, that's where my taxes are going. Yeah. You know, but that's when your ta- taxes are for. Yeah. But when your taxes mm-hmm. aren't providing that, you'll have all this extra money and you'll be more willing to be well, somebody does have to take care of these people. Mm-hmm. And every person may not be that way, but plenty will be. Yeah. And you worry about, um, so there's a few things that come up in, in when I start having this discussion or when I've had this discussion in the past yeah, (laughs) repeatedly. Um, and one of them is, uh, well, what about the parents that aren't willing to spend money or send their kids to get an education? So, well, first of all, most parents, the vast majority of parents will do whatever they think is best for their kids. Yeah. Um, and they will do whatever they can to give their kids a leg up. Yeah. And if that's education, then that's education. Yeah. But the other thing is, and we can call back to that um, that court case in the EU about where where they said that uh, in the end, what's best for the child is the most important thing. And st- and that was about vaccines. But when you think of it in terms of education, you say, okay, um, so a family decided. And I'll come back to the odd cases too, but um, if a family decides that education isn't important for their kids, who are you to tell those parents that what they're doing for their kids is the wrong thing to do? Yeah, it is. It's not your place to tell them how they need to live their lives or raise their kids. Like that's the whole point of this country in the end is so that we could all choose our own ways to live as long as we don't hurt anybody else. And, and deciding not to educate your kids, um, you can make a case, Potentially that that hurts the kids, but that's not your place to decide. That's the parents' place to decide. They get decide to decide how they raise their family, not you. At that point, it becomes a question of how much do you want the government involved, Mm -hmm. and how much does the government want to be involved? Because the government wants to be involved as much as it can be. Yeah. Well, no. So I disagree. I think the question becomes how much do you think that you should be able to tell other people or that other people should be able to tell you how you raise your kids. Yeah, but the other people is the government. <laughs> well, it, it is, but yeah. but the question's the same. Yeah. Um, and I think that we should all think of it that way. Yeah. The, the, the question isn't whether... Uh, there isn't a difference between you telling somebody how they should raise their kids or somebody telling you how you should raise your kids and the government telling somebody or you how to raise your kids. Yeah. The, the moral question is the same. Yeah. Um, is how much... How much do you? How much control do you think that other people should be able to exert over how you raise your family? Yeah, and well, the government true. falls into that category just as much as anybody else. Yeah, but there's the government no difference. has the m- most enforcement mechanism. Well, that's absolutely true. But just because you use the government to get your way in other people's families, that doesn't make it any more or less moral. No, I agree with that. Absolutely, the, the question is still the same. Yeah, no, I agree. 
Um, and, uh, and so as for the families where the parents are just bad parents, um, historically speaking, that hasn't actually been a problem. Um, if, uh, if a child showed, so say, yeah, if a child showed that they had some kind of promise in an area, um, and you know, if you're talking about historically speaking, uh, a poor fam- a child in a poor family showed promise in the area, um, and the family couldn't afford an education for the child. Um, they would end up with a sponsor. Yeah. There would be some patron that would that would recognize that talent or Step whatever, in. and yeah. and say, okay, well, I will see to this child's education. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, so the that's not a, that's not a problem in and of itself. And the other thing is that, it, like again, if you have um, a bad set of parents that aren't treating their children well. Somebody in the community, some other family member, well, is they're, they're almost all, always steps up. There's, I was fixing to say, there's always at least somebody in the family or a neighbor. Mm-hmm. Somebody's going to see what's going on mm-hmm. and and do what they can to help. Yeah, you know, you don't need government for it. No, no, uh, and, the, and the government is is very bad at handling those situations. That's also true. <laughs> anyway, like I know very few people who's dealt with DHR mm-hmm. that that. If one DHR even really needed to be involved, mm-hmm. and and they've done nothing but make a mess of a of what is already a bad situation. Yeah, um, and that's just my personal experience. I mean, I'm it sure it was maybe, DFACS in Georgia. What's that? It was DFACS in Georgia. Oh, it's DHR now down yeah. here. Yeah, Department of Family and Child Services. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like I said, I don't know anybody, and like I said, I'm not saying these people don't do good work. in, in some instances, mm-hmm. I just haven't seen it. Yeah. You well, know. most of the most of the kids that end up in the government system uh, for their formative <laughs> years, yeah. I guess, yeah. um, don't end up very well adjusted. No, no. I uh, mean, and yeah, you can look at that, and that that you can tell that. I mean, that's a problem in itself. Yeah. You know. Um, and then the the other thing that I hear a lot is, well, uh, th- especially if I complain about my money go into educate other kids, yeah. other people's kids. Yeah. Um, since I don't have any, why am I responsible for other people's education? Um, yeah. the answer is often, well, we all benefit from a well-educated public. That's and true. I, and the government's not providing that. So, well, even, <laughs> I, even if they were, yeah. um, I still disagree. Yeah. Uh, it depends on how they're being educated. Yeah. Right. Well, so, my way of viewing the world, is, I, so my way of thinking is not being taught. In fact, I would say that a way of thinking is not really being taught in school. What to yeah. think is being taught in school. And oh, that still disagrees with my perception of the way view. things should yeah. be. Oh, absolutely. Um, and so am I benefiting from that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, my, my, um, my answers are not, not being brought um, to the fore. Yeah. And so I would say that it's actually uh, hindering um, what I espouse is the way that people should live. Yeah. And so I'm certainly not benefiting from that either. Yeah. Um, and yeah, the, the other answer is also, well, they're not doing a very good job anyway. Yeah. And the other side of that, and this is something that I was talking about with, um, with my family's accountant uh, yesterday, is that uh, there's a real problem with the understanding of civics. Yeah. And 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 this also falls into the whether well, public yeah. education if, benefits. If the government all. is going to educate our kids, they should at least teach them how the government is supposed to work. <laughs> that's not in their interest, though. That it's not, and yeah. and that's the reason they don't do it. Yeah. But like, it still doesn't make a. I mean, they're the ones educating them. Yeah. You think they would at least tell them how their system operates? Yeah. Well, their system operates in such a way is supposed to operate in such a way where government doesn't actually have that much power. Yeah. And if right. you are educating people people um if if you were taking control of the education of somebody and you don't really have the power to do that you really don't want them to know no exactly (laughs) exactly um so but in in terms of whether a public education benefits me or not uh if they're if people aren't being taught what their what rights even are what rights really are and certainly what their rights are does that actually benefit me and i would say no it doesn't benefit me no it doesn't it doesn't benefit benefit anybody anybody. Yeah, yeah exactly so um, so I'm opposed to public education, which was a really interesting <laughs> thing to do when I was running for board of education. Yeah. Um, but I had real honest conversations with people about, yeah. about this. And I said, look, like, I understand if you don't want me to go in there and tear down the whole system. And frankly, I can't. Yeah. 
Um, but what I can do is I can try and make some changes so that at least you're getting your more bang for your buck. You're getting your money's worth out yeah, of it. Yeah. That maybe we could get public education that costs more than private education to be at least start to on be on a level, level. Yeah. Um, as, as a private education. Yeah. And of course, one of the things that I promoted was school choice, yeah. which everybody's against. I mean, not yeah. everybody obviously, but like <laughs> it, it's, I was amazed at how many people were against that. Yeah. Um, and most of it comes down to, well, I don't want poor kids being educated with my kids, <laughs> <laughs> well. which, uh, you know, I mean, is a, is an interesting perspective, yeah. but, um, the truth is that the competition raises the level all the way around. Yeah. Um, if schools funding was dependent on, uh, the number of students they have and the number of students they have was dependent on how good a job they were doing. No. Um, then all schools would strive to do a better job. Yeah. And it also helps in other ways too. So the, the argument there was also that, well, um, if poor schools are just going to keep losing students. Yeah. And I said, yeah, is that so bad? Yeah. Well, then, well, and then <laughs> so, and the, so, so we have fewer make, kids going to bad schools. Well, okay. And not only that, it helps in another way too, because that means those class sizes are going to be smaller. Exactly. And so the people that are still in those schools will probably get a better education by having, by benefiting from the smaller class size. Yeah. And that's what I told them too. Yeah. Um, uh, that was actually, there's, I think there's an article up on the website from way back when, yeah. um, where Talking I made exactly, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, made exactly that point. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so the, the smaller class sizes, they get more personal attention and generally get a better education yeah. anyway. And then that school will be a better school and then more kids will want to go to it. Mm -hmm. And then it's a, it, like, it's, it's a positive cycle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know? I mean, that, everybody really seems to benefit from it. And in the end, you, you reach some kind of relative parity. Yeah. And, uh. And that, that can only be good for it all may the be, kids. It may be good for you to kind of explain to people just a little bit about school choice. Some people may not know what you mean oh, by school choice. Um, okay. Uh, the, the question is, so as it stands right now, you have to show a, a parent or guardian with an address in the particular district of the school uh, that they attend, they, the children attend. Yeah. And so school choice would give people the option of taking their kids to a school outside their district as long as they can provide their own transportation. Yeah, yeah. So we're not so, talking about running a school bus to your kid yeah. in, in Robertstall to Bay Manette or something like that. Yeah. I mean, um, the buses will still run to the local school or whatever. Right. But, but under the system, you if you wanted to send your kid to another school in the county, you would, mm -hmm. you'd have to take them there. Yeah, if you're dissatisfied with the school that you're uh, that's in your district um, and you wanted to take your kids to a school that you perceived as being a better school in another district... As long as you can take them there and pick them up, you can. Yeah, yeah. And I, I just, because I, I, I went with you, I helped a lot in this campaign you had, mm -hmm. um, and I was just like, I was really shocked at the amount, the amount of people who were against that. Yeah, I was like, too. I mean, I because I, I didn't it, think that that was going to be something that I ended up debating no, with people a lot. I, I didn't either. Yeah. When it kept coming up, I was like, man, like people really aren't on board with this the way I thought they would be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. I also got arguments about, uh, you know kids um going to different schools because of the sports system yeah well and that the would athletics. be that would be a factor i mean you would have plenty of that but it, it but i still think the same thing like i think that it would still be positive for everybody involved i mean yeah. if you're if your kid's good enough at a sport that he can go to a, a, the best school for that sport mm -hmm. then he'll get on the team but mm -hmm. if your kid ain't that good and he's trying to go play at daphne for football yeah. like he may not make that team yeah <laughs> you know yeah um, and the other thing is that it, the the concern was that there would be severely overpowered teams. I was like, well, they're already they are. already are. Like, um, yeah. But then you know the idea is, well, all the best players would go to the best you know to the school with the best team. Yeah. No, they wouldn't. Because yeah. they want to stand out to be recruited. Because they still want to play, yeah. yeah. And I mean, a mediocre at, at, that can play every game is different mm -hmm. from being on the biggest, best team yeah. where you you may get the ball a handful of times. Right. So, yeah. I mean, all of that goes in. It's the same way with college. Like, I mean, that all of yeah. that's a decision in your decision-making process. Mm -hmm. And you have to make the best decision for yourself. Yeah, and let that be which a part is, of it, and that's is, fine. Which is what we promote on this podcast. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. So... And, and that's what I kept telling people then too, is that like, yeah. you know, well, the, these are the, the choices that you get to make, but it's better, it's better to have these choices than to not. Exactly. Exactly. So. 
but not everybody agreed. <laughs> no, no. I was shocked at the amount of people that didn't agree, actually. <laughs> but it was um, a fun campaign they're in. It, yeah. Yeah, what? Well, I don't know. I'm doing that again. Well, no. I, need, I, I need more help than just you. <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> if I'm doing that again. Yeah. And Matt. I, sh- I, yeah. Shout out to Matt. Matt helped a lot, too. Oh, yeah. Um, all right. So, well, uh, I don't have anything else that I really wanted to cover. No, um, I'm, I'm good. For uh, a podcast that I was totally unprepared for, I well, feel like we did it. Okay. We had said before we started, and even yesterday, that this was going to be a short one. Yeah. This is not a short one. It's, it's about average. So, um, so uh, okay. Well, uh, we didn't miss a week. Um, nope. I, there was some concern at some point that we might. Yeah. Uh, we didn't, so we're here again. And we plan to be here again next week. Yeah. Um, in the meantime, uh, follow us on Facebook. Um, subscribe on uh, YouTube, Podbean iTunes or wherever you can yeah. find us. Um, like and share, particularly yeah. share. We like shares. Uh, yeah. Comment. Um, I don't know. Yeah. That's Email good. me if you have suggestions or comments that you want just for me, Michael at the Liberty Mike. Although somehow that email got onto some list and I've been getting a bunch of junk. Uh oh. <clears throat> I, I don't know if I if I should blame one of our listeners or not. <laughs> Somebody's like, we're going to spam this guy. <laughs> yeah. It's probably somebody in my family actually that had the address saved and, yeah. and got hacked or something. But it, anyway, don't give my email address out to, <laughs> you know, marketing companies, please. Yeah. Um, give him, give him Gary's address, which is Larry <laughs> at the Liberty Mike. Cause he never checks it. In. Yeah. That thing's so full of junk probably anyway. Yeah. Might be, might be. I don't check it either. So, <laughs> so here we go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, we'll be back in a week when we finally get this right. In the meantime, try to stay free. Life short, live free. Ciao. Later. <laughs>